Good morning. It's good to see everyone this beautiful Lord's Day morning. Thank you for being part of our Bible study time. We are continuing our series of lessons in this class uh, in the book of Isaiah. This is really part two, and we, we, uh, a quarter ago we started and did part one of Isaiah. And we're now uh, in, in the second part. We're going to be in lesson three today, page uh, 21 in your book. If you have a book, if you need a book, there are books on the back table. Um, there are also, I think, probably some extra ones in the library. Isaiah chapter 43, if you'd like to be turning your Bible there in the Old Testament, that's where we're going to be uh, in our discussion this morning. And if you're visiting our class, won't you know it, this is a discussion class, it's not a lecture class. Even though I'll be doing most of the talking probably. Um, but if you have a question or comment, raise your hand or somehow get my attention. And we'll be happy to um, deal, deal with that. The lesson's entitled, You Are Precious. In what context do we use the word precious today in our modern way of speaking? Babies, alright, I see it constantly when somebody posts a picture of a baby. Usually some woman will say, boy, that's, that baby's precious. You know, I've noticed that men don't oftentimes use that term very much. Time. I don't know why. Time is precious, isn't it? How many of you think time is precious? The older we get, the more precious it gets, doesn't it? It seems like the faster it clicks off the clock, too. And I think that, that speaks to its preciousness. Every day is precious. When you're 90 plus, every day is precious, right? Not to name any names. But we appreciate that. Um, about 75 times in the King James Version of the Bible, the word precious is used. Usually, and I didn't look up every 70 plus one of them, but usually it's talking about things of God or things created by God, okay? Uh, I find that significant. I want to look at two particular passages. When I think of the word precious, it's not really in context with our lesson today, but I just wanted to point these out. I, can't, I think showing the, the importance of things being precious. Both of these are found in Psalms. So keep your finger there in Isaiah and go to Psalms. First one is chapter uh, 116. Psalm 116. These will be familiar passages to you, I think. <clears throat> Psalm 116, verse 15. The psalmist here says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. You know, death comes to all of us, doesn't it? We've all had family members, friends, relatives, that die. It's so much more precious when they die in the Lord, isn't it? You know, I've said before, um, some of the hardest words to say in a eulogy to somebody is when that person, when we don't really know or we suspect that they haven't lived according to God's word. That's hard, isn't it? Um, and, you know, those of us who uh, preach from time to time have, have had that opportunity to do that. And I, I use it as a time to encourage, but I also use it as a time to teach. Because I believe if that person could, like the rich man in this, the parable of rich man and Lazarus, if he could speak and tell people today on this side of eternity what to do, I think they'd be a clear message there. And I think it's up to us, obviously, to, to tell that that. To make that message plain. The second one, also in Psalm, is in Psalm 139. <clears throat> Talking about precious. Psalm 139, verse number 17. This psalm is attributed to David. Psalm 139, verse 17, he says, How precious also are your thoughts 
to me, O God, how great is the sum of them. What's he saying there? What, what is precious to David, the inspired writer? The knowledge that God considers him, right? Is that not, should that not be precious to us as well? It kind of, it kind of touches on some of the things that I, we're going to read about in Isaiah, talk about here this morning. God's view of his people. Okay. Here in our introduction, he says, God's relationship with the children of Israel was not a secret. True or false? True. Wasn't a secret, was it? How do we know? He goes on here to cite, you know, the, the pagan nations that, that the Israelites had to deal with from time to time. They heard. You know, they didn't have the internet. They didn't have the 24-hour news cycle and all that kind of thing back then. But they heard about these, this group of people, the Israelites. They heard about all the things that God had done on their behalf. Parting the Red Sea when they left Egypt. I'm sure they heard about the plagues. I'm sure they heard about all those things. <clears throat> How about <clears throat> when the generation of Israelites finally, through with Joshua, cross over the Jordan River the first city they come to, a great walled city we call Jericho. He sends in spies. They go to Rahab's house. Her house was on the wall. What, did she, what had she heard about this group of people? She heard about what they had done. Other kings in other uh, lands and how, all those kind of things. She goes on, this is recorded in Joshua chapter 2. And as soon as we heard, this is Rahab speaking, says, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, children of Israel. For the Lord your God, he is God of heaven above and on earth beneath. Did they believe in the God of heaven, these pagan nations? No, but they heard about him, and they realized that hmm, something's different here. Okay. A bond clearly existed between the God of heaven and the Israelites, and we know why that was. Scripture reveals that to us. You know, something, though, he mentions here towards the bottom of page 21. He says, although some of the Israelites seemed to believe no harm would come to them because of their special relationship with God. Do you think that was the case? They had a special relationship with God. God had provided for them, taken care of them, done all these great and wonderful things for them. But were they, did they have a get-out-of-jail-free card, so to speak? They didn't. There were still conditions on God's promises. God's promises were always there, weren't they? But yet, they had to act in a certain way. If Israel, and we've talked about this numerous times, and, we, and we'll continue to talk about it because it's important. If Israel faithfully, this top of page 22, if Israel faithfully obeyed the Lord, blessings would follow. Otherwise, what? Punishment, right? As we talk about, we've studied the book of Judges. It's just an endless cycle, isn't it? Prosperity, because they follow God. They're blessed. Things are, things are well in the, in the land. They, they start dabbling with idols and being influenced by the people around them, and they fall away, and they forget God, and they, God usually sends them somebody and says, get right, or... You know, something's going to happen. They don't listen. As human nature oftentimes is. God punishes them. They cry out for deliverance. God hears them, delivers them, and it all starts over again, doesn't it? This scenario played out before the eyes of Isaiah's audience in real time, he says. The people of Judah watched as the Assyrians decimated Israel 
and carried their brethren away to captivity. You know, we're dealing with a divided kingdom, Israel and Judah. Israel was carried away um, first by the Assyrians. They, he says they should have, this should have caused great reform in Judah. But did it? It should have caused them to wake up, shouldn't it? Say, hey, we, hmm, something's not right here. Look what happened to, to our brethren up north. Um, it did not, our author says. It didn't cause them to, to, um, to reform. Why do you think it didn't? Any thoughts on that? I think if I saw somebody be punished because of something they did that I knew that wasn't right, am I going to do that same thing or continue that same thing? I hope not. But oftentimes we do, don't we? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Faith brings up a very good point. She says sometimes right after that event, maybe the next day or the next few hours, you th start thinking, hmm, maybe there is something to this. Maybe I need to change. But then... As time, the time element builds in there, you, that thought goes away, doesn't it? You know, a real life example for most of us is uh, September 11, 2001, right? We know what happened that day in our country, to our country. What, was, what were people doing that, that night and the next day and the next few days? Praying, going to church. Getting, you know, holding their loved ones close. All those kind of things. What were they doing on September the 11th, 2002? Same thing they were doing on September 10th, 2001, right? Most people. Okay. We don't oftentimes learn, do we? We're hard-headed oftentimes. Um, I, you know, that's... That's one of the reasons why I like studying the Old Testament is because it gives us real life examples of how God deals with people during good times and during times of disobedience, during times of punishment and all that kind of thing. Judah's punishment, he says here, will eventually come or eventually uh, came at the hands of the Babylonians. But it would not take place for more than a century after Isaiah prophesied to the nation. Nevertheless, Isaiah spoke as if that punishment had already occurred. He did not, however, leave the nation without hope. You know, one of the key, we talked about sometimes how it's difficult sometimes to study the book of Isaiah because of the prophetic language and, and all those kind of things. But I think one of the keys to Isaiah that we need to keep in our minds as we approach the book is that of hope. How would you define hope? It's one of those kind of nebulous words, isn't it? I mean, we all like hope and love hope and, pre and glad there is hope. We have hope. But how would you define it? Belief that something's going to happen. You know, think of it in terms of something inevitable, I guess, maybe. Something that's, you know, if you have hope, that gives you an outlook, a perspective, a hope, a uh, uh, it's hard to define the word hope without using the word hope, but uh, anticipation, positive anticipation, right? It doesn't mean wish, does it? Yeah. Yeah, it's more, uh, you can't expect it, right? It's a surety, something that we can build our life on, right? I heard it said recently, it's, the gospel provides the greatest insurance policy you'll ever have. Because it, you know, we, we buy insurance to protect us against something. Something physical usually. But the gospel provides us something that's going to keep us for eternity, isn't it? And that's what provides us that hope. Questions or comments?
punishment that hasn't happened yet, but then he's already telling them, I'm going to be with you during it. I'm going to bring you back after it. Yeah, the perspective is that he's speaking like it's already happened. It's not going to happen uh, to Judah, the, the nation of Judah, until a thousand years. Most of these people are going to be, <laughs> they're all going to be dead, right? But the next generation, and again, but the thing about it is, Shannon points out that it, it builds, it, it continues to cement the fact that God loves them. He's going to take care of them. Yes, he's going to punish them, but he still loves them. And he's going to bring them out of it. You know, I, I keep coming back to the parent-child relationship. We have to punish our kids for disobedience, don't we? It's because we love them. We don't want them to keep on being disobedient because we, we all know the end of that. Okay? God loves his people. He always has our best interests at heart. But he is, he's not going to tolerate disobedience. He's not going to tolerate sin. And he does those things to try to bring us out of that, to open our eyes, so to speak. He says here, the prophet described how the Lord, because of the special relationship he enjoyed with Judah, would, not, or would both conquer the enemy of his people and prepare the way for them to return home. There's going to be a time of punishment. But he was going to prepare a way for them to turn, to turn home. And we're, as our lesson unfolds, we may not get to it, but the, the ultimate uh, you know, symbolism kind of here is he's going to, the ultimate hope is coming through Jesus. Okay. Um, let's look at <clears throat> the first seven verses there of Isaiah 43. He calls this point, uh, through the water and the fire. Isaiah 43, verse 1, beginning. But now says, or thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, <clears throat> nor shall the flame scorch you. Verse 3, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east, gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. What do you think about when you hear those words? I don't know about you, but it encourages me that God thinks enough of us to do all these things. Now, he, obviously, he was talking about this, peop, this group of people that, were, that was originally written to, but I, think, I don't think it does any damage to the text for us to associate some of these feelings, these thoughts from the heart of God about those of us who are his people today. Okay? <clears throat> Again, we talk about a special bond God enjoyed with the Israelites. Notice the words there, created, formed, redeemed, called. Is that all true? It is, isn't it? The relationship between God and these people. He set them apart. The God who created, redeemed, and named the Israelites continued to care for them. This assurance was intended to remove their fears that the relationship was severed. There was a, you know, you could, <clears throat> I think you could, uh, you know, 
the thoughts maybe some people had there that God had forgotten them. But that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, one of the commentators he cites here, he says, Whatever Israel's blindness and insensitivity may have been at the, in the past, God says they are to forget that and concentrate on one fact. Whose they are, and he says, Much can be endured if we have a sense of destiny born out of particular identity. Strip that away, the identity from us, and we think going on in life is hardly worth it. The repeated words, do not fear, particularly address, addresses this issue. The fear that God has forsaken them, or worse, never was theirs in the first place. Thankfully, God considered them His people and reaffirmed His devotion to them. Think about this for a second. When I was reading this, I was thinking about you know, he says, much can be endured if we have a sense of destiny born out of particular identity. What does that mean to you? What about this concept of identity? It's a big buzzword in this world today, I think. People are trying to find themselves and trying to determine where where their place in this world is and all that kind of thing. And unfortunately, much of that thought process comes out of not having God in their life, I think. Um, so they go off on all this crazy stuff, oftentimes. Um, but I think, to me, when I read that, that phrase there from that commentator, I was thinking, you know, when we recognize whose we are, That gives us strength, doesn't it? It should give us hope and encouragement. Jeffrey. I think that kind of goes along with verse 7, everyone who is called by my name. I think that's uh, something we can enjoy in this day. If we're called Christians, it, it makes sense that that would still pertain to us. Mm -hmm. and that would give us a sense of hope. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it, verse 7 there, uh, everyone who's called by my name. When we wear the name Christian, that gives us a sense of idea. It gives us a place in this world, doesn't it? We recognize that this world is temporary and our time here is short. Our time is precious, as we said earlier. But it gives us purpose. We don't have to just be tossed around with all the different winds of change and the latest fad and, the, and all those kind of things. We can find our identity, we can find our character, we can find all those things that we need to be successful in this life in Christ, can't we? And through His Word. Let me pause there for other questions or comments. Charles, do you think they uh, fully understood the promise? Do you think they fully understood the promise? No, probably not. No. They, uh, you know, as, and I don't know that we would if we were in their situation, you know. Right. And think about too, Tom, you know, it, yes, it is hard. And also it's hard when we're in the midst of some, what we consider to be calamity or disaster or health situation or whatever we're going through in our life. It's oftentimes hard to see the other side of that, isn't it? As humans. Okay. Think about those people in captivity. God had said, you know, I'm going to bring you out of this. But I'm thinking day to day, it's going to be hard for them to, to think beyond their present situation. We, you know, we as humans, even as Christians, we oftentimes get bogged down in problems of this life, don't we? And oftentimes we let it take our focus off of, of God and serving God and, and, and all those kind of things. Because it's hard. But we need to realize that that's where we draw our strength and our hope is from, from that. She says, yeah. Billy brings up a good point. You know, back in the old days, parents taught their kids, you wear our name. Don't, don't bring any reproach on it by your actions out in the world. 
and she observes that I don't know if that's taught anymore today you know I'm sure in some families it is but in by and large by the world it's not is it because again people people are so um, pro individuality I guess is it for lack of a better term you 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 know be your own person and you do things your own way and 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 that's that's all well and good, but when it comes to doing things that are contrary to society, contrary to God's word, and all those kind of things, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that. God has given us a name. We need to remember whose we are when you're on social media, when you're at, at work, when you're at school, when you're talking to your friends, when you're driving down the road. All those kind of things. Remember whose you are. Do you think people would say some of the things that they say and do and, and write some of the things they write on, on social media if, if their name was John Christian or some, some identifier that identifies you as Christ? I hope not. But that's something to think about, isn't it? Or maybe if you had a big bumper sticker on the back of your car that said, I'm a Christian. Are you going to be trying to run people off the road and speeding and all those kind of things that, that we see people do, road rage and all that stuff? I hope not. But this, this thing about identity, I think it's important for us to think about. <clears throat> and coupled with that, he uses the concept of destiny. What's our destiny as Christians? Heaven, right? That's what we're living for. That's what our hope is. That's what we're striving to, to the goal we're trying, striving to meet. He says, God's care for his people would be demonstrated when they faced and overcame certain trials and difficulties. Here in, our, in the passage we read, verse 2, he says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overthrow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. He says walking through fire may be a metaphor for uh, acute affliction, though the experience of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could well indicate the reality of such punishment. What happened to those three young men? Recorded there in the book of Daniel. Fiery furnace, right? He says, God's wrath will not be poured out upon them, but rather he will save them when they pass through the fire. Emphasis pl is placed on the presence of God with his people. Having promised to be with his people as they endured hardships, God reiterated his commitment to them and described how he would ransom them. Because of God's love for them, the people had no reason to fear. He says the section ends by echoing verse 1. God has vested interest in the nation. What is vested interest? Something that he valued was put into them, right? Ultimately, something he valued was put into all of us. The blood of his son, right? Vested interest. He created, formed, and made them for what purpose? Last three words at the bottom of 24. For His glory. What does that mean? Our actions, are, our purpose, our reason for living oftentimes should be glorifying God. What, what did the wise man write? towards the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Remember that passage? Everything's vanity. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. This is the all of man, our purpose. Fear God and keep His commandments. Bring in God the glory because He's worthy of it. He created, formed, and made us for His glory. Uh, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Uh, bring glory to God through your, 
And let your light so shine that men may see your good works and what? Glorify God. <clears throat> Point number two in our lesson. Let's pick up our reading in verse number eight. <clears throat> He calls this point, My Savior before and after me. Bring out the blind people who have eyes, verse 8, and the deaf who have ears. Let, them, let the, all the nations be gathered together, and let the people be assembled, who among them can declare this and show us former things, he asked. Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified, or let them hear and say, It is truth. You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside, besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am He. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who, who will reverse it? Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring them all down as fugitives, my Cal the Chaldeans who rejoice in their ships. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. Isaiah here, <clears throat> back in, in chapter 42, our author points this out. He says, God described the Israelites as blind and deaf. Were they really blind and deaf physically? No, they were blind to God's word, weren't they? To the truth. Isaiah 43, verse 8, he used similar language and offered, bring out the blind people who have eyes and the deaf who have ears. Despite their spiritual shortcomings, God intended to deliver and transform his people. You know, that's one thing that I, again, I think scriptures give us hope in these things, that these people were um, not perfect, were they? We're not perfect today, but God's promises still apply to us. He goes on here to say, This fits well with the general declaration of God's purpose of restoration made in the preceding verses. The people mentioned have been blind and deaf in that they have not seen the wondrous working of God in the earth, nor listened to the heavens declaring His glory. To the truth, they were blind and deaf. Now, however, they have both eyes and ears, for they now see and hear willing to follow him who has brought them out of the darkness of bondage and ignorance. <clears throat> Think about <clears throat> being, uh, you know, when you get a, uh, a clean bill of health, maybe you've had some, calam uh, some illness or injury or something, and then you get, you know, you get beyond that. How does that make you feel? Relieved, right? Free. Don't have to deal with that anymore. That's probably just a very small example of the people who were freed from bondage, right? Do you have a comment? Okay. I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. Um, but here God is telling them that, that, that that's, that's going to be the case. The pagan nations were called to watch God deliver His people and see his great power firsthand. Because their false gods could not match his ability to, to predict the future, they were forced to concede God's exalted position. What is a witness? God says here, you are my witnesses. What is a witness? In the, in the judicial sense, what's a witness? Someone who sees something and they report that, right? They tell uh, what they saw. Um, could there be any greater witnesses at this point in time than God's own people, for to, witnesses to His power? Obviously not. 
but yet what happens when they you know they discount his power and they they don't <clears throat> they don't serve as witnesses it's not the way the not the way God intends right how about today as Christians are we God's witnesses in this world we should be right You know, oftentimes that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily come in the form of sitting in a court witnessing the things that God has done to, for us and that sort of thing. It's not. But how about how we live our lives day in and day out? Are we not to show God's glory through our actions and words and the way we live? If it's our identity, it's, it's almost impossible to to keep it quiet, right? Um, I'll be the first one to tell you, I need work in that regard. Because oftentimes we, <clears throat> we oftentimes feel ashamed, don't we, that we're Christians? Because we know how the world views Christianity and things of, go of a godly nature. They view it in a negative light. So we're not so ready oftentimes to to tell people we're Christians or to point out that we're different than the world and all those kind of things. You know, I've, I've used the example before in my corporate life. I work with a lot of folks who are um, different than us because of the, you know how they were raised and their ideals and their perspectives on life and and I, oftentimes, you know, they want to know something about your personal life or your hobbies or those sorts of things. And those of you know, I like to hunt and fish and I like to shoot and I like guns and all that kind of stuff. I shy away from a lot of that stuff when I'm talking to those folks. Because I know how they view that. I guess that's okay. That, I'm not going to be condemned for not saying that. But when it comes to my Christianity, am I willing to stand up and speak up in the face of, of things that are ungodly. We oftentimes tell ourselves they won't care, they won't listen, so I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I think that's a cop-out, isn't it? That's an excuse that we oftentimes use. Um, by and large, that may be true in our world today. But I would submit for our thinking there's probably at least one person that's looking for the truth and maybe we're, maybe we're the key to showing that to them. Right. Yeah, we, we are to give them the information. Let them make the decision about what they're going to do with it. Okay? You know, we... we Again, we, you've heard me say before, we live in a microwave society. We want to throw the gospel out there to somebody, we want an immediate response, don't we? We'll put that bag of popcorn in there, and a minute 30 later, I want a bag full of popcorn. It doesn't work that way, does it? The gospel will change people. But it may take 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It may never in your lifetime, you may never see the fruits of the seed that you plant. But that should not discourage us from continuing to plant the seed. Bob? Sometimes I think we do uh, give up too quick, take the easy way out, and we try to teach someone, and take several times and talk to them. Sometimes give up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob says oftentimes we give up too soon. You know, we don't like to be hurt, do we? We don't like to think that our time is wasted, that we spend on, on people and things like that. Sometimes it just takes time, doesn't it? 
Um, but that should not excuse us from trying to plant that seed. Okay. But oftentimes, like Faith says, we, we view the world as like, well, here's the thing that's gone through my mind before. Well, they've got, they've got the Bible. They've got all this religious programming. They've got all this stuff. They can find it just like I found it. Well, maybe they can, but maybe they can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, see a sermon versus hear a sermon, right? That concept. Um, Courtney brings up a good point. You know, it's if we fully believe and we're invested in the destiny that we've been given through Christ, how are we going to keep it quiet? We, I think we have to work hard to keep it quiet, don't we? Um, made me think of a verse. Let me see if I can find it real quick. But... But yeah, it's uh, um, when those, when you, uh, you know, when, when we're, so let's say we're planning a big vacation somewhere, maybe next year, a year, a year in advance. It's our destination, so to speak, our, our destiny for vacation next year. Do we keep quiet about that? We talk about it for a year, don't we? If we've got a destination of heaven, we shouldn't keep quiet about it. Um, let's see if I can find this verse. Okay. Colossians, and this will be our final thought. I think our time's about up. Colossians chapter 3. You know this passage. But I want to show you something about it. Three sixteen, Colossians. We use this verse to encourage uh, and to show spirit, uh, scriptural proof of, of singing in our worship, non-instrumental singing. But he says here, Paul the inspired writer, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. The point is this. When you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, you can't help but teach and admonish one another. True or false? Let our goal be that we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly enough that we can't keep it in, I think is the message. We're going to talk about it. We're going to live it. We're going to have hope that it, it's, it's, it's there waiting for us. Peter would say, reserved in heaven for you. Okay. Questions or comments as we close? Right, someone in, was willing to invest the time and the effort and energy in, into you, into your soul. Um, it's something to think about in it. We'll pause there. Thank you for your comments, your presence this morning. We look forward to seeing you on the next lesson next week.
Good morning, folks. I hate to break up this great fellowship that I hear uh, going on, but uh, all things have to cease at some point, right? And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, welcome any and all visitors. Uh, we are delighted that you have decided to come worship with us this morning, and, uh, and we pray that we'll have the opportunity to uh, get to meet you and uh, have an opportunity uh, to worship again in the future. Uh, some announcements uh, in addition uh, to the bulletin I'd like to bring uh, to your attention. Uh, let's uh, begin uh, with a sick I've uh, been given to uh, given to me this morning. Vicki Newberry uh, had her biopsy uh, of her intestinal issue last week and is awaiting results. Well, I don't know what the results are, but we'll let you know. Okay, please pray for Ashlyn Cooper, a five-year-old girl hospitalized at Erlinger Children's with pneumonia. She will be there one to two more weeks. Uh, her grandparents attend the Single Mountain Church of Christ, and uh, they uh, covet our prayers. Ashlyn Cooper. Also, uh, from the uh, bulletin in front of you, uh, we're glad to hear that uh, the Wilsons, uh, Carla and Tony, uh, have recovered from COVID. Uh, we also uh, need to keep uh, Tony's mom, uh, Lillian, uh, in our prayers. As you all know, Robert Smith had uh, rotator cuff surgery, a joint re shoulder joint replacement, and he is on the mend at home. And I can tell you personally, it'll, it'll take him a while. And so I talked to him this week, and he said he probably wouldn't be here uh, this week. And believe me, if you've had this surgery, you can understand that he may not be here for a while. But he seems to be uh, progressing. Uh, there was an issue with uh, in line, a pick line uh, for uh, injection of pain medication that broke off and in his chest area, and they'll have to go in and uh, remove that. Uh, Eli Joyner, this is Tanner Pickett's cousin, is now at home, and he still has a long recovery. And he, that's the individual that was involved in a very serious accident that resulted in the deaths of, of some young men. Randall Webb, a friend of Mitty Gandhi, he's also one of my friends, and uh, through his uh, work uh, through East Ridge Church and with some mission work in Central America, uh, he is uh, recuperating from open heart surgery. So please pray for Randall Webb. Uh, we also ask to uh, remember Lisa Holland's niece, Hope, is recovering well from her recent surgery. Uh, Candy uh, Baumberger, uh, this is uh, one of the elders' uh, wives at East Ridge, Paul Baumberger, uh, she is not has not received good news about her cancer treatments. Uh, things are not going well. I know Paul, and I've actually uh, roomed with him on trips to uh, Nicaragua in the past, and uh, to think this uh, is going on with a young lady like this, young woman, uh, is uh, very difficult, but they're uh, very faithful people. So please pray for Candy and Paul bomb burger uh, also please remember in thinking about card requests to uh, there's an address there on your bulletin to remember janice richie's mother Dottie dixon and her address is there in La lenore city with regards to uh, lenore city i was handing a note that tom earl has moved to lenore to uh, lenore city and uh, this has just now been brought to our attention. So Tom Earl has moved to Lenore City. Another note here uh, given to us, uh, to the church, thank you for the financial help uh, you gave to make our spring formal possible. We all had a wonderful time and are so grateful for the help to make it uh, that way. I think there's about 29 signatures on this card giving their thanks. Some events uh, we need to keep in mind, and I know you all uh, can read, but please keep in mind Care Team 3 meeting uh, this afternoon uh, after our afternoon service. Uh, there will be upcoming uh, last leaders meetings coming up, and this will take place on Wednesday, June 29th. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer on the table, and if you would like to help and be involved uh, with that uh, program, uh, we, we have to begin to make pl uh, plans for uh, next year. The new Youth Truth uh, Bulletin is on the bulletin board in the hallway. Please uh, 
take opportunity to read that. Uh, also, if you have opportunity to attend the North Hamilton seminars, uh, speaking seminars on Tuesday evening, the speaker this coming Tuesday at North Hamilton will be Don Blackwell. And he always delivers a really a great message. I have a little asterisk right here. It says that Midge Harrison wants to make bed covers for the homeless that the city is putting into homes. So if you can help, please call or text Midge Harrison about uh, your willingness to help with making bed covers. I think that's enough uh, announcements. Uh, you can read the rest of them. Uh, at the proper time, uh, we'll be uh, led in singing by Charles Abels. Our open prayer will be by Travis Friedel. The Lord's Supper will be uh, overseen here by Gabe Dixon. The closing prayer, Stephen Lawrence. Let's all uh, prepare our minds uh, to worship God by going to God in prayer. Heavenly Father in heaven, we uh, are really privileged and blessed to have an opportunity to worship you, Father, this morning. We pray that our only intention this morning is to bring praise and honor to you, Father, and that recognize you as the, uh, the greatest spirit and in all the world and all the universes, seen and unseen. Father, we pray that our worship will be acceptable to you, Father, and that we can bring honor and glory to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. First song this morning will be 874, number 874, Jesus is Lord. <clears throat> I encourage everyone to join in our worshiping song this morning. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how he loves. Four hundred forty-four. Number four, four, four. We'll sing this. Prepare our hearts and minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper.
Moving to our act of worship of a, partaking the Lord's Supper, does everyone have a packet here that needs one at this time? If not, raise your hand. You will be brought one. Looking at the Institute of the Lord's Supper, I don't think anything I'm going to say here today will be new to necessarily anybody, not anything that, that as members of the church that we don't already know. Uh, but it's good to be reminded of those things, and you never know who may be listening via live stream uh, that have questions and of course anybody anytime that sitting in this audience or see anything to be a live stream live stream that we do here you have questions about please reach out to us give us the opportunity anything we do here in worship or that you've heard preach from the pulpit to give you book chapter and verse of why we carry out the things in which we do jesus institutes the lord's supper it was a most solemn occasion when jesus instituted the lord's supper his earthly ministry was nearing its end. The agony of Gethsemane, his betrayal by Judas, his trial, the condemnation, and crucifixion were all about to be experienced within the next 24 hours. The weight of the world's sin, that's the weight of my sin and your sin, weighed heavily on his heart. The shadows of the cross grew deeper and darker. To prepare himself for the dreadful ordeal, Jesus gathered the 12 apostles about him in the upper room to eat the Passover. Jesus sought strength in this spiritual feast. For 1,500 years, the annual observance of the Passover had been a reminder to the Jews of their deliverance by the shedding of the blood of the Passover lamb. When about to uh, shed his own blood for the sins of the world, Jesus desired to establish an institution by which the memory of his sacrificial death would be forever kept alive. So he instituted the Lord's Supper. Read about it in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, 26 through 28, Luke 22, 19 and 20. And I'm going to read Paul's account to the church at Corinth, found 1 Corinthians 11, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus established the Lord's Supper as a memorial to his death on Calvary. He wanted to be remembered. He wanted us, his followers, to remember the, that he died for our sins. He wanted us to remember his life, miracles, sermons, resurrection, intercession, and all things else he did but he especially wanted us to keep in mind his atoning death on the cross. Let's now have the prayer for the unleavened bread. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this loaf, which to us by faith does represent thy son's body that hung on the cross at Calvary. We pray now, Heavenly Father, we take of this in a worthy manner that is well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. By observing the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, which the first century church did do, it's found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we keep alive the memory of Christ in our hearts. We also feed our souls, for this supper is a spiritual meal. When we eat and drink at the Lord's table, we receive strength, edification, comfort, and assurance. Our faith is strengthened, our hopes revived, our zeal is rekindled, our trust deepened, and our love intensified when we thus commune with Christ around his table. If we would be fed spiritually and grow in Christ's likeness, we must be faithful in partaking of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Let's have the prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our Father in heaven, continuing in prayer in a light manner, we ask that you bless this fruit of the vine, which represents our son's blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. We pray now, Heavenly Father, as children of thine, we examine ourselves and take this in a worthy manner that was well, well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. But at this time, we also recognize the act of worship of giving back unto the Lord and see the screens that are, are the scripture that's put up on the overhead at this time to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. In verse 7, so let each one give as he has purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Good principles laid out on how we are to give back unto the Lord and have we been prospered. We do have an offering plate that's in the back. If you're not able to give on the way in, please do on the way out as you have purpose in your heart. And let's go to God and recognize those blessings that he's bestowed upon us. Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time of giving back to you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we do so as you have commanded us to do, as we look at the principles that were laid out before us in thy word, that it's a condition of the heart, Heavenly Father, and the manner in which we give, that we have set aside and purposely give to you as we've been prospered, knowing, Heavenly Father, that not just spiritual blessings, but all blessings that we've received on this earth come from you. In our lives, Heavenly Father, at some point currently now and in our past, you have given us, each of us, the ability go out into this world and earn a living to provide for the basic things that we need to survive here. And we're uh, not blind to the fact, Heavenly Father, that uh, money is needed to carry out thy work uh, here in the kingdom uh, while we are here on earth. And the many facets of the missionary work in which we do to the everyday conveniences we enjoy in this building right here. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we always have the right mindset and give back into you, not grudgingly or necessity, but with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. song before our opening prayer will be number 11. Number 11. Above the bright blue. <clears throat> Sweet rest awaits. 
pray. Holy God, we come to you this morning. We're so grateful for the opportunity you've given us to gather here this morning to hear a portion of your word and have it offered to our hearts. Lord, we're mindful of those who perhaps have chosen to not be here. We pray for them and pray that we might be your influence to them to help make a choice to come back and, and join us here at this congregation. Lord, we're also mindful of those who may be sick, traveling. We pray for their well-being, for their caregivers. Lord, we pray for those traveling or away with family to have a safe trip back to us. Lord, we're mindful and grateful for those who have returned to us that uh, we we see faces that perhaps we've not seen in weeks, and we're, we rejoice at their ability to come back and take of this worship service. Lord, we mindful of our eldership here at Saudi. We pray that you be with them as they make their choices and or make their decisions that uh, help guide us here. We pray that we follow them in a mindful and, and obedient manner. Lord, we're mindful of Joel and his family and the work that they do here. We're so grateful for them, Lord. And let's let us never uh, let us never overlook uh, what's what's been shared with us here, and be mindful. Let let them be mindful and know how much they're loved and 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 what we think of them. And we're so grateful he's willing to share his talents. Lord, we're mindful of each and. Every person in this assembly this morning, those that are participating, we pray <clears throat> be with Charles and as he leads us in song. We're grateful for the opportunity we've had to gather around the table and commemorate the death of Christ, and may we never take that for granted. Lord, may everything that we offer up to you in this service today be in accordance to your will and from our heart and in we offer it in a manner pleasing in your sight. We pray this and all things in Christ's name. Amen. When the gospel invitation is extended at the end of our lesson this morning, we'll sing number 788 as a song of encouragement. Wonderful words of life, 788, if you'd like to mark that in your hymnal. Prior to our lesson, let's stand together and sing 37, number 37, Angry Words, number 37. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue unrivaled. Let's fall be thus to death. 
Be seated, please. Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. We're thankful for the good crowd that is assembled here. We have a few folks who are away from us. We also have a lot of visitors with us this morning. You know, we're always thankful for the families at this congregation, many of the families that go back uh, for so many years, and we're always thankful when uh, part of that family can be here. I was standing in the back as we were getting started and thinking we've got a, a bit of a competition, a bit of a race this morning. There's a few more Williamsons here, and we're thankful that they're with us. There's a few more Robertsons here. We're thankful that they're with us. There's a few more Lawrences here. We're thankful that they're with us, and they're all filling up whole pews, and we're thankful for that. So, But it's good to see you, and we're just thankful for the opportunity to study together this morning. Charles and I had talked a while back, and uh, he had mentioned that sometimes it might be important or good for us if we took a look at sermons that connected together through both of our services. Sometimes we do that, sometimes we don't, but especially with us having lunch here in just a few moments and then a 1.30 service, we'll hope you be back with us then in just a little while as we assemble again at that time, but we're going to do that today. We're going to kind of take a, a look, a little bit longer look at, at something in particular that we're going to talk about this morning, begin talking about. I really just accused him if he was trying to get me to preach shorter in the morning, you know, spread it out over two lessons and not talk as long in one, but uh, that's all right. We're going to do that today, and we hope that you can be back with us again this afternoon at 1.30. If you have your bulletin in front of you, you may have noticed the title of the lesson is A Matter of Death and life. Now, it's backwards in the way that we usually say it. We usually say something is a matter of life and death. There's a reason for that, and we'll get there in just a few moments. But when we are talking about a matter of death and life, if I told you this morning that that is something we were going to talk about, I would probably have your attention. Now, I know the setting that we're in, and you know me, and, and I know you, and you may think, well, that's not something in particular. But what if you go to the doctor's office, or what if you get a call from the doctor's office, and they say, we need to talk, we need you to come in, we have a matter of life and death. Is that not what we've been through over the last two or three years in our country? Uh, I don't want to argue about it, we don't have to talk about it, but wherever you fall on the spectrum of mask or no mask or vaccines or whatever, that's been part of the discussion was whether or not this was something that was a matter of life and death. And of course, in a sense, it certainly was, as many people in our country and around the world have died, but, but that's what's been the question in some instance, in some way, is it a matter of death and life? What about something like even in the picture here, a, a picture of a bomb? You know, if someone says there's a bomb or you thought there was a bomb threat, we would treat that as a matter of death and life and something that needs our attention. Well, this morning we're going to talk about a powerful weapon. In fact, through scripture, it may even be listed or discussed in such a way that is the most powerful weapon in all the world. You know, we get caught up in things sometimes like anthrax or, or things like bio-nuclear weapons or nuclear weapons. And that's, that's all the discussion sometimes right in the news about who's developing these chemical weapons or nuclear weapons. But as you're going to see this morning, you really, I mean, really, you already know. We're going to talk about maybe the most powerful weapon in all the world, but it's not something that some country can develop, but it's something that all of us carry with us each and every day. It's that thing that's included in our mouth, thing that we call the tongue. It's, it's like this. Let me ask you this. If, if we were to go back in our memories, all of you that are a little older, if I were to ask you, what would be the thing that got you backhanded by your parents the most? What, what would be the thing? Was it because you were hitting your brother or sister? It was because you didn't pick up your room or take out the trash? Or would it be the thing usually when you were, what we say, running off at the mouth? Was it your tongue sometimes that got you in the most trouble with your parents as you were growing up? We think about our tongues and we think about the fact that with our tongues we have the power to or the power not to as we think about some of these words to gossip, slander, outbursts of anger, boasting, lying, cursing, being critical of others, verbal abuse, dirty jokes, complaining, betraying, and above all, you could even lead someone astray with the power of your tongue. Simply a little bit of false teaching, and it is certainly the most powerful weapon in all of this world because we can tell someone something that's not true, have them believing a lie, and their soul be lost because of something that we have said. This morning we want to talk about the most powerful weapon in all the world, and in fact the Bible does say that it is a matter of death and life. And that is, of course, the power of words, as this slide says, or the power of 
our tongue. You know, this is uh, from the PowerPoint that, that we use, have access to some of these and try to pull them and use them into our, into our slides and into our lessons. A lot of this website that we use also have some of the countdown timers. Maybe some of you have visited a place or attend a place where they run a little timer you know, on the screen as it's time for worship to start. And, and a lot of these start at five minutes. So a few months ago, back the first of the year, when we were having Bible Bowl practice in here, the kids were for lads to leaders, I would give them a break. We'd take a break for a few moments. I'd say, all right, be back in here in about five minutes. And one time we were in here using the screen to study the questions. And I started that timer at five minutes with a picture of a bomb on it. Uh, now, they understood, I think, that we weren't going to kind of uh, detonate some kind of bomb, but it's amazing the power of the mind, right? You see a bomb, you see a, a counter counting down, a timer counting down, and it's something in our mind that causes us to think about the power of that. Well, there's power in our words, and there's certainly power in our tongues. To begin, though, think with me for just a couple of moments about a few physical things. Before we get into the Bible and the, the spiritual things, think about a few of the spirit, uh, physical things. Have you ever considered physically? The tongue is not, doesn't have a skeleton. You know what happens to your elbow when you've been moving stuff or playing for too long? That joint pain begins to hurt, right? Well, rather than a few muscles that kind of attach it to our body, of course, the, the, the tongue doesn't have a skeleton. It has no joint pain, so what does that mean? It's already, always ready to fire, right? There's no, no way that it's usually worn down in a sense or like our knees. Boy, I just don't think I can walk today. You know, my knee's really bothering me or my elbow or whatever it is. No, no, no joint pain in here, right? We're always ready to go. And we're usually ready to fire at anyone and everyone who stands in our way. Maybe not always. Hopefully that's not of our nature. But certainly that is the case when we're upset or bothered, or for some of us, maybe you have that kind of temper or kind of show those outbursts sometimes, the tongue physically, in a sense, even doesn't have that same kind of pain. What about this, our taste buds? You know, we always taste what is going in, and it's so wonderful, isn't it? But we don't taste what is going out, do we? Someone else has to taste that. You know, I listened to one particular, I was reading one article, and it was talking about the taste buds and how there are different uh, parts of the tongue that taste different ways. And then I heard somebody else say, well, that's not true. That's been debunked by other scientists and studies that really our whole tongue kind of is a part of our taste bud and those kinds of things. But regardless of that, think about the fact that we taste what's going in with our tongue. But boy, when we give some of those bitter words, some of those sour words, we shoot those out. We don't taste those the same way that we taste what's going in. But boy, it sure leaves a taste in someone else's mouth or a taste in somebody else on their, uh, their mind when we kind of come in that kind of fashion. What about this? It's the only body part that has its own cage, right? You know, we can't control everything else, but we got this, this cage that God built in where we can just kind of close it off and then hopefully nothing comes out, right? But I don't know. Sometimes we have trouble controlling that cage. But it comes with its own cage. Maybe God's telling us, you know, we always talk about the fact that we're to be quick to hear, right, and slow to speak, two ears, one mouth, listen, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, we also got a little bit of a cage too, baby, in a sense that we need to keep it closed, keep it locked up sometimes. Physical sense, maybe there are some things that remind us that we need to be careful with the power of the tongue. But we even think about our Bible. We're going to talk about a passage in just a moment. But even really all throughout the Bible, God has always shown an importance in words, right? The tongue, the power of the tongue, the power of words, they, they've always been important to God. We go back to Exodus chapter 20, and it's two of the Ten Commandments, right? The idea of the third commandment, we might say, do not take God's name in vain. Do not use our tongue in that way. What about the ninth commandment? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Two of the Ten Commandments deal with the power of the tongue. God's always had a way or wanted to share with us the importance of our words and our tongues. What about Proverbs chapter 6? Do you remember Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19? These six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination to him. So we usually talk about the seven things that God hates. Well, two at least, and we'll make the argument for three, deal with the tongue. One of those is a lying tongue in verse number 17. Also in verse number 19, a false witness who speaks lies. Both of those, again, two of the seven, deal with our tongue. Things that God hates. 
But I would suggest for your thinking as well, number seven, at the end of verse number 19, and one who sows discord among brethren. Now, I see you sitting there in those pews. You could probably sow discord among brethren if you just steal somebody's pews in the church building, right? That's one way. But most of the time, if we're going to sow discord, what's it with? It's with our tongue. So we could say two, certainly, but maybe even three of the seven things that God hates deal with the power of the tongue. Come back this afternoon, we're going to talk even further back or a little bit more about some examples, some instances in the Old Testament that, again, remind us that words have always been important to God. But this is just a couple. But I even was thinking about Wednesday night. If you were with us on Wednesday night here in our auditorium class, we talked about conversion or salvation. We talked about the idea that God doesn't work on our hearts, as we say, a lost person's heart by the Holy Spirit. It's not something that just hits us in that kind of way when it comes to conversion. God has always used words. When you look on the pages of the New Testament, every time someone is saved, there is a preacher present. Someone who has delivered the words of God. We thought in particular about Acts 9, 10, and 11 there where Peter goes to Cornelius. And as there's the recounting of that, Cornelius had sent these men to Peter so that Peter could come to him. And he says, I want to know the words by which I can be saved. That's what's going to be told to him. Not the Holy Spirit, not some miraculous thing, but the words. Words have always been important to God. But now, if you have your Bible, go to James chapter 3. And let's think about James chapter 3 for just a moment. James chapter 3 and verse 5 is on the screen. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Now that's right there, kind of in the middle of that section. But, but think with me for just a moment about a few other things here from James's epistle. Well, first of all, we would notice that it's found in James chapter 3. In fact, I didn't count the words, but it's almost found right smack dab in the middle of the book of James. With all the things that James says before, and he talks about the tongue early on, with all the things that James says in the back half, and he talks about our words and our prayers in the back half, James 3 is the middle, and it's right where he talks about our tongue and our words. Now, this is a lesson that applies to all. I think that's what's interesting about this. You know, sometimes we talk about conversion. We may think, well, that's something for older people and even our teenagers, those who are of the age of accountability, we say, someone who can reason and think about those things. There are some lessons maybe when we talk about the Holy Spirit, as we have talked about recently on Wednesday night. The Holy Spirit can be something that's a little difficult to understand, and maybe that's something for a certain group of people. Or we talk about marriage. We talk about parenting. But not here. This is a lesson that applies to everyone. Whether you go as far down as Campbell or Thatcher or Emmett, or whether you go as old as James or Bob or Tom, it doesn't matter. This lesson applies to everyone. But you know what I was thinking about? It's kind of interesting. If we were to go through the body and we were to handpick the body part that we, we like the most, say, Or I'm a sports guy, you know, so I like drafts. You know, the NFL draft is coming up or the NBA draft is coming up and that kind of thing. You think about, well, we choose the most important part or we choose the best part. Where do you think the tongue would fall? I think it's easy for us to say, well, you know, boy, I sure like some good food. I mean, we already smell it sometimes here on Sunday morning. I I love to taste good food, so I would pick the tongue. But have you ever considered when you look through James chapter 3 that it's probably the least desirable body part? In fact, it might go last on the list because the Bible says it is something to be avoided. I started to make a list and go back and forth and think about the good things and the bad things. Yeah, we can taste good food with our tongue, but we taste bad food as well, right? What about the fact, if you're open there to James chapter 3 and verse number 8, one of the other things that we should look at when we're, we think maybe we would avoid the tongue, it is impossible to tame, right? Verse number 8, no man can tame the tongue. Why would I want to choose first the body part that I can't even control? What about verse number 8 again? It is unruly evil. An unruly evil, full of deadly poison. If I gave you the choice between things and one of them was full of poison, you wouldn't choose it. It'd be last on our list of things that we would desire. What about James chapter 1? I told you he talked about it. James chapter 1 and verse number 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, 
this one's religion is useless. The power of the tongue is that it can make our religion useless. Have you ever known somebody? Have you ever known somebody who claimed to be a Christian who maybe sat in these pews one day for one service and when you see them out on the street or the grocery store or the baseball field or the basketball court or wherever and they can't control your th their tongue and you think, boy, what kind of person is that? One of the easiest ways to show that we are hypocritical. I, I read an article this week, someone was talking about modesty and they said, you know, the, the, the first example that we often see somebody is their clothes and that's why we preach on modesty and it's important to talk about modesty because they look at us and they're going to draw a conclusion pretty quickly if we're a Christ follower or not but do you know what's first or maybe really close behind in second place it's our tongue it's our words when we preached about modesty a few weeks ago we talked about sometimes it's like our accent you know you can tell very quickly if somebody's from the south we, Hannah and I had the chance to go to Romania when we were in college on a mission trip and we had to take the subway, you know, there around Romania to travel around and we were with some other ladies from the south and we said, please don't open your mouth when we're on this because they'll know quickly where we're from or who we are. They'll certainly realize we're American. And so you have to be careful because you recognize from somebody's tongue where they're from or we see about them. And James says it makes our religion useless. That's the power of the tongue. That's the power of our words. But he also gives three examples that are listed here. If you've opened up your Bible there, the first one is in chapter 3 and verse number 3. And it's the idea of a bit. Now listen, I am the furthest thing from a horse person. The closest I get to coming to be a horse person is knowing uh, Kristen Duncan. That's about as close as it comes for me to knowing anything about horses or anything about that. But we understand the concept of a bit and a horse. A powerful powerful horse. Again, I don't know much about them. I've not been that close, but I've heard people who talk about the damage they can do, whether they throw someone off or were to be kicked or something by a horse. A powerful object like that can be controlled by a small bit. And not only that, the bit controls the whole body. Again, if you've ever tried to ride one or be around them before, we don't have to know much. I don't have to be an expert. James didn't have to be an expert to use this example, but that's one way in which James here shows the power of the tongue and the power of our words. Secondly, we talk about a rudder. Once again, not a boat person, not much of a ship person here. Been on a few, understand how they work, but it's amazing to me. I mean, we've not been on a cruise, my, my family, or never been on a cruise before, but it's amazing to me to think about those large cruise ships, right? how big they are, how many rooms there are, how many people are on them, and then this little small rudder in the back. And I know sometimes like on a cruise ship, they're bigger, but still compared to that ship, something so small. Likewise, just like the horse, the small bit controlling the powerful horse, a rudder controls the whole ship when it's moving around. Those are both in verses 3 and 4, if you've turned there to James chapter 3. The third one is in verse number 5, and that is the idea of a small fire. A small fire. Now, if you've talked to the Wilsons at all, you may have known they're from Nevada and the California area. They can probably give a little bit better testament than many of us of the fires that sometimes control or are uncontrolled, excuse me, in that part of the country how they destroy and do so much damage to the world around them. But even us, right? We've experienced it not too long ago there in Gatlinburg, the Pigeon Forge area. I don't know if you ever had a chance to go up and examine some of that hillside, mountainside. We got to stay in a cabin a few years ago. Uh, not long after that, two cabins that had been redone, but all around us was still charred trees, blackened forests, and the foundations only of some of those cabins that had been burnt to the ground. Just a spark. Just a spark is all it takes often to start those fires and to do so much damage. In fact, you may have studied in history before the Great Chicago Fire, right? The Great Chicago Fire of 1871 killed 300 people, destroyed 2,000 acres, and somewhere between around 17,000 structures destroyed by that Great Chicago Fire. Fire. I think officially they never said they knew exactly what caused it, but one of the, the examples that was used most often was a family that lived there that had a cow, and that cow kicked over a lantern. The Great Chicago Fire, 300 people and all those structures by just a spark, just a start of a fire. 
You know, the first two examples of a bit and a rudder, that they show control, but this one shows destruction. Our tongues can control us, but this one shows the destruction. You know, somebody said the, the modern example is the steering wheel, right? James didn't have a steering wheel to use, but how much damage or how much control do we have in a steering wheel? It's easy to take for granted too, isn't it? Put one hand on it, just kind of touch it with a finger, not touch it at all, and it steers for a few moments, maybe still straight. Go to jerk it, what happens? Go to lose control, and what happens? And it can destroy a car, and it can take lives, and all of those things. Just something, something so small has so much power and can cause so much destruction. Two other notes real quick before we move on. If you're there in James 3, look at verses 6 through 8. James also gives the idea that the tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. It defiles the whole body. It doesn't matter our outward beauty. It doesn't matter how much time we spend in the gym. It doesn't matter how beautiful we can make ourselves. Our tongue can destroy all of that. Our outward beauty can be great, but no matter our outward beauty, the tongue can defile the whole body body. And not only that, in verses 7 and 8, we're reminded that as mankind, we have been able to tame basically everything, right? The circus, the king of the jungle, the lion. Yes, we can control some lions. We can control other animals. We can make them do everything we tell them to do. But we can't control that little thing inside of our mouth. We can't control our own tongue. And it's important James spends 12 verses at least here and again touches on it throughout his whole epistle that we remember the importance of trying to control our tongue. Two things here and the lesson will be yours. Number one, our goal, we should strive for consistency. Notice in verses 9 through 12, the rest of that part of the section of James chapter 3. We should strive to be consistent. Had another good crowd this morning in our young adult college age class, but we talked about the idea of consistency. You know what that, you know what that means? That that means in our life we should be consistent. We were really discussing the idea of how do we disagree with people sometimes in society. Whether it be through social media or whether it be in the workplace, how can we disagree with people on some things like homosexuality or abortion or, or maybe some spiritual matters like baptism or salvation or those kinds of things or maybe just things that don't matter so much maybe things that aren't as important as salvation but things like COVID or other things that we've talked about and, and one thing that we pointed out one tip that we need as Christians is we need to be consistent in our lives we cannot stand for the truth or say that we don't believe in certain things, or we believe the Bible teaches this on certain matters, and then live another way. We can't try to straddle the fence. We have to be consistent in the things we do. And that's exactly what James is talking about here. How is it that we can praise God? The singing was beautiful just a few moments ago. We praise God together, but we're going to walk out those doors in a few moments, and then we're going to begin to lie. We're going to begin to berate our spouse or our children. We're going to use foul language. And the list could go on and on. How is it? How dare you? We tell our children sometimes, how dare you use your tongue that way? And yet as adults and as Christians, we'll stand here and praise God with one tongue and walk out and do something totally different with the same tongue. We will bless the one who made us, and yet we'll spend our days tearing down the ones who are made in his image. What does James say about that at the end of verse number 10? My brethren, these things ought not to be so. How can it be? Paul would say, God forbid, may it not be so. That should be the last thing on our list that occurs. Is that we would be two-faced, that we would be hypocritical, that we would bless God one, in one way with the tongue and then curse others or even curse him or of the list that we even gave earlier, gossip, slander, lying, all of those things that we could put up here. We need to strive to be consistent. You know what the bad news is, right? It takes effort. It takes work. It's not just something that we can master overnight just like that. A lot of us would be the first one to sign up if we could step down into that water and be baptized and rise up to walk in newness of life and our problems with our tongues be fixed. It's not so. James says, this should be the last thing that occurs. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. 
We should not be like the the tree or like the water, the examples he gives in verses 11 and 12, that send forth fresh water and bitter water, a fig tree that bears olives or a grapevine that bears figs. It's not, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen in regards to science, plants, water, it doesn't happen. But it happens when it comes to our tongue. But not only that, we even think here finally about the key. The key to this, because we say, you know, we can't do it. It's impossible. It can't be tamed. But here's the key. The key is our heart. If you've got your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 12 with me for just a moment. Matthew chapter 12, and then we'll begin to conclude this lesson. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus talks about this idea that, yes, James says it's impossible. Of course, James is going to write later. But Jesus is going to kind of allude to the fact that, yes, it seems impossible. But this is the key. Matthew chapter 12 and we think about verses 33 through 35. Matthew chapter 12, 33 through 35. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers. Strong language, Jesus, but yes it is. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You see, this morning I can't promise you a quick and easy fix. I can give you the suggestion that God gave. I can give you the suggestion that Jesus gave. Fix your heart. Of course, we don't mean the, the blood pumping organ. Fix your mind. Fix your heart. Have you ever met somebody who was, was calm most of the time? Do you ever remember that person getting upset and how it kind of takes you aback? Well, I know it must be bad if he or she got upset. Well, it's because it's not their nature. It's because their heart, their mind, their life is one of calmness. And when something else comes out, we see there's something amiss. For some people, though, they can put forth that maybe calm, cool exterior. But as they're always constantly lashing out and biting with their tongue, we know where it comes from. It comes from a bad heart. May we strive to follow this example, the suggestion of God to fix our heart. Because here's the thing. It can only be tamed with God's help. We're fighting an impossible battle by ourselves. But with God's help, fixing our heart, our tongue, will never be perfect, but will be mature. We'll hopefully be better in our relationships and the way that we use our tongue. It is a matter of death and life. Do you want to have useless religion? James says if you do, don't bridle your tongue. If you want your religion to be something that is worthwhile, that is helpful, that encourages others, then you've got to learn to control your tongue. This afternoon when we come back, if you have your bulletin, you may have seen the title of Speaking in Tongues. We're not going to so much talk about the idea of speaking in tongues as the Bible dis discusses it, but maybe some tongues that we can focus on a little more directly. Maybe some tongues that we speak in, things like anger or love, and how we can try to do better about that. And we hope that you'll come back for sort of the concluding part of this lesson. But as we're about to sing the song that's been selected, appreciate Charles asking and looking ahead as many of our song leaders do. Wonderful words of life. That's what we have given to us by the word of God. The wonderful words of life. We can hear them and we can obey them. Being added to the church by God so that we can begin to live a faithful life. Part of that faithful life is by giving those wonderful words of life to the world, sharing them with others. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a child of God. We'll be singing to encourage you that you would obey those wonderful words, that you would become a Christian even this day or study with us as soon as possible. Maybe you're here this morning and you know it's a struggle to remain faithful. You know how hard it is to use our tongue correctly. Maybe you're here this morning and your sin or your trouble is your tongue. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's just something else that is amiss in your life that you'd like to make right with God. We're thankful for the opportunity that presents itself 
at this time that we can think about those wonderful words. That you can become a child of God. That you can come back to Him. That you can enjoy the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ to do what's right and to be living a faithful life. Do you need to make a change? We'll encourage you now as we stand together and as we sing. Be seated, please. I asked Ricky, <coughs> Ricky Rich if he would come forward. weeks ago we submitted Ricky's name for to be able to serve as a deacon at this congregation and uh, we also asked if anyone had anything that would cause him by the scriptures not to be able to serve to please put it in writing and give it to one of the elders well we did not get any writings and we're thankful for that but we did get a lot of people that approached us and told us they thanked us for submitting and choosing Ricky to serve as a deacon for this congregation, and we're thankful for that. The elders believe that Ricky is well qualified by the scriptures found in uh, 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 8 through 13, to serve this congregation. And we, the elders, have all the confidence that Ricky will be able to serve this congregation well. Uh, we need to ask you one question this morning, Ricky. Are you willing to serve this congregation to the best of your ability as a deacon? Yes, sir. Thank you. We now appoint you as one of the deacons of our congregation, and we're really happy that you chose to serve this congregation, and we're want you to know that we'll always be willing to work with you and help you in any way that we can. Uh, we're so thankful for men like Wiki, uh, Ricky that willing to take the time to serve the Lord's Church here at Saudi and we are so thankful for our deacons that we have because of the way they work together and serve this congregation. 
And Ricky, we want you to know that the elders and the deacons are all looking forward to working together with you to uh, do the best we can for the church here at Saudi. Now this morning, I, I would ask you to please remember Ricky in your prayers, pray for him as he enters this great work of service. And we ask you also to pray for your elders as we make decisions like this from time to time. After we have had our closing song and our closing prayer, I would encourage you, Ricky and I will be sitting over here to come forward and, and let Ricky know how much you thank him for uh, what he's already done for this congregation and how he's going to uh, serve the congregation in the future. So we'll now turn this back over the service to uh, Charles. closing song this, this morning will be number 138 number 138 we'll sing verses 1 3 and 4 before we're dismissed as it's already been said we have uh, lunch prepared if you're visiting with us 